Hey guys, Zom Fox here, and today we are finally back to talking about the original United States Football League from the 1980s. It's been a while since we've done a video about the original league, but as I alluded to during the live stream this past week, I have a couple of these videos actually being ready for you. Now this is going to be part one of a two-parter. As you can tell by the title, we are looking at the top five best franchises from the original USFL, meaning that the next video or part two of this is going to be the five worst franchises. So if you end up enjoying this video, make sure to subscribe with the bell on and be notified as soon as I upload that video. That'll probably come out next week, basically a week after this one. But when we're talking about franchises, we are not just talking about wins and losses, okay? We're going to be talking about the overall franchise, the attendance, wins and losses, postseason success, notable players, coaching staff, general managers, slash owners. Basically everything about the brand, the team, everything in regards to it. So this is not going to be a list where simply put the Panthers come in at number two because they won a USFL championship and the Invaders at three for making it or something. This is based on everything around. Now, of course, winning championships, winning games matters a lot. And attendance matters. There's a lot of things that matter, and so depending on how you kind of judge each thing, you can very easily change this list up a little bit, but a couple of these teams are going to be in your top five no matter what, and a couple big-name franchises do barely miss out on this list. So without further ado, let's get started with number five and probably the most controversial one, the Michigan Panthers. Yeah, this might be a shock that I'm putting the Panthers at five. Now, the reason I'm putting them at five is mainly because of the fact that they technically weren't sustainable as a franchise. Look, they did increase in attendance by 10,000 from 83 to 84, which is impressive, but their sixth position in 83 was middle of the pack, and sixth in 84 was a top third, but just barely. And in terms of their, you know, live or sustainability, they were forced to pretty much go away in 85, because unlike other teams which may have tried to compete against the NFL, the Panthers weren't, and essentially... Taubman was going to move the team or merge the team and ended up merging them with the Invaders. Now, their merger with the Invaders is actually why I think they are guaranteed this spot, along with them winning the championship in 83. They are one of two teams to win the USFL championship, but what's more impressive is that a lot of their players, because of the merger with the Invaders, ended up going to the Invaders and helped the Invaders get to the 85 USFL championship where they eventually lost to the Stars. But, for instance, Bobby Aber and Anthony Carter, two of the biggest named Panthers, were huge on that 1985 Invaders team. Now, again, this is a very controversial pick, but I think that when you look at the Panthers, they only played two years, and it wasn't because they were part of the 84 expansion. It's because they couldn't last in 85 because of the fact they didn't even want to attempt to see what the attendance would have been. We saw multiple teams that, once it was announced, were going to move to the fall in 86 if that season had happened, saw their attendance go down in 85. So it is very possible that Michigan would have gone back down to that 22,000-ish number in 85. They weren't insane in attendance, as every team above them pretty much beats them in attendance aside from one, and that one team you can probably guess who they are. So when you see that every other team beats them in attendance, lasted all three seasons, and were all really good teams, they might not have won a USFL championship, but at the end of the day, the Panthers only won two playoff games, which other teams did win that many as well, just they didn't win the championship, which is a big deal and is a huge reason why the Panthers come in at five. Another issue is that in terms of true huge name players, their coach in, wasn't the biggest name of all the coaches on this list. And while somebody like John Corker was a legend in the Arena Football League, their overall massive name players list is pretty small compared to a lot of these other teams. So because of that, they come in at number five. Now, number four on this list is going to be the Tampa Bay Bandits. Look, you cannot do any of these sort of best USFL franchise lists without mentioning the Tampa Bay Bandits. Okay, during their heyday, they were beating the Buccaneers. They were a better team, they did better sales locally, and their attendance was even pretty close. When you look at their attendance, they hit almost 40K their first year in 83. They hit 46K in 84, and even with the announcement that in 86 they'd move to the fall, their 85 attendance was still 45,000. They had the league's best attendance in 85, and they had the second best attendance in 83 and 84. That alone arguably could put them at number three or even number two. When you add into the fact that they had some of the biggest names in the USFL as well, Burt Reynolds, megastar, was a part owner. John F. Bassett, when you talk about the history of the USFL, he's one of the very few owners you always talk about. Steve Spurrier, legendary coach. 
And then you look at the names on there, Gary Anderson, John Reeves, Nate Newton, Lex Luger, Ron Simmons, Jim Fitzpatrick. Those guys all are different things, whether it be acting, whether it be wrestling, whether it be actual football. They're all big names in a lot of different ways. So they succeed in that front as well. The only thing that hurts them is the fact that they were not a successful postseason team. They did not lose to an eventual, cha eventual champion. They lost to the Stallions and Invaders, who neither of which won a championship. While the Invaders did get to one, they still didn't win it. Now, yes, the 35-21 and 21 record and the three straight 10-win seasons is very impressive and, one of the, and is insane. But they're not the second most wins in the USFL despite that solid 10-plus win every year. While they had the very famous banded ball as well, I think that, again, this is another controversial one to some people. You could very easily move this team into the top three. My issue is that winning does matter to some degree. In terms of postseason success, this team is one of the two that have essentially no actual success. They made it there twice, but they had no success. And so, again, you could easily move this team higher. When you consider the fact that their attendance and the notable people involved in this organization, it is insane. I mean, it really is. I mean, Lex Luger and Ron Simmons are both mega star wrestlers. Steve Spurrier, legendary coach. Burt Reynolds, legendary actor. And then you look at their attendance. They hit almost 40K all three years. That's insane. And so because of that, they deserve to be on this list, and I think they are a better franchise than the Panthers. They might not have won a championship, but when you consider their attendance, how they did against their NFL counterpart team in that city and what their notable people, players, coaches, all that are, I think the Bandits deserve to be above Michigan, and that's why they're at number four. Now, because of the postseason success, I'm going to give the Birmingham Stallions number three. Attendance-wise... They weren't nearly as good as Tampa, though in 84 and 85, they were at least really good. Now, their first year was not all that great. 22,000 average was 7th. That is basically in the middle. But 84 and 85, their attendance actually jumped up to 36 and 32,000. In fact, it was almost 37,000 and 84, both of which were the 4th best attendance in the league. Now, this team mainly gets above the Bandits because of the fact that both times they lost in the playoffs were to the Stars, meaning you could make a very real case that if they had beaten the Stars, they could have won back-to-back -back championships instead of the Stars. They also have the second most wins in USFL history. They barely beat out the Tampa Bay Bandits in that regard. The Tampa Bay Bandits, you know, as we just mentioned, had 35, whereas the Birmingham Stallions had 38, despite not hitting 10 wins that first year. But just like the Bandits, it was still a 500-slash winning record didn't make the playoffs, and then they made the playoffs the next two years. A 14-4 and 13-5 and and records are really good. Again, they beat Tampa Bay in 84. They beat Houston in 85, but both those years they lost to the Stars. It is very possible that they could have won or gotten to the U.S. Well, they would have gotten to the championship and could have won it if it wasn't for the Stars. So when you have both those facts with them, it shows that as a team, they were really the second best team in the entire league aside from maybe the Invaders. Basically, those three teams were the big three of the league in terms of just being truly great teams. Now, their notable people is not as good as the, as the Bandits at all. When you look at it, Scott Norwood is probably the most famous name you would say of all these guys. There's some other big famous guys. Cliff Stout, as I talked about in the top 10 best original USFL quarterbacks I did last time. Very underrated quarterback. And that's where they suffer. So three and four is definitely what I say depending on what you think of is more important. If you view the attendance and people being more important, the Bandits move up to three on your list. But if you view that winning does matter, then the Stallions deserve to be higher. The Stallions were a postseason successful team. They only lost to the Stars. When you only lose to the best team in the league's history and you lose to them the game before the championship because you're in the same conference... It's possible you could have won a or two championships if it wasn't for the Stars. You can't say that about Tampa Bay. Without the Stars, Tampa doesn't change. They still don't win a championship. Whereas without the Stars, it's very possible the Stallions do win one, maybe two. And their attendance was good enough to at least be a very respectable fourth in the league in 84 and 85. And when you consider that one of the teams I'm just going to mention as an honorable mention later, was above them and the other ones, it's impressive that they were fourth. So I think that they deserve to be on here. They were a franchise that would have lasted in 86 if the league had played there just like the Bandits would have. So the Stallions come in at number three. Number two is going to be the New Jersey Generals. 
Look, the Generals, postseason-wise, not successful. This is the other team I was mentioning when I was talking about it earlier. They did not win a single playoff game. Now, they also lost both of their playoff games to the eventual champion. The only difference is they didn't win a playoff game beforehand, but they still did lose to them twice. And the more important factor is that in 84, the Stars went 16-2. and Those two losses were both to the New Jersey Generals in the regular season. So they lost the trilogy match, New Jersey, but they beat them in the regular season twice. So again, this is another instance where it is possible that if it wasn't for the Stars, the Generals could have won a championship or two. Now, 85 is less likely because of the QB play and all that, but 84, they really could have. Now, the Generals come in mainly at number two because the fact is that before the USL, you know, came back in this modern iteration in 2022 and merged with the XFL to become the UFL, this is the team everybody knew. Look, yes, the Stars were the team that won, but when you ask somebody name a USFL team, you name the Generals. Whether it be because Herschel Walker was there, whether it be because Doug Flutie was there, whether it be because their owner in 84 and 85 was Donald Trump, whether it be because of the whole coach situation where they almost had Don Shula as a head coach, whether it be Brian Seip, Kent Hull, Chuck Fairbanks, Walt Michaels, this team, all of those names are super famous. When, the, when Kent Hull is probably your least notable player slash you know, person involved, that says something. That's a really good overall sort of franchise. Then their attendance was third all three years. 35,000, 37,000, 41,000. It improved each year, which is very impressive. So when you look at it, I think the Generals deserve to be number two. In terms of being the famous team, they were the most famous. In terms of having famous players, they had the most famous guy. They had the most famous owner. They had the most famous overall just everything really in a lot of ways the general's branding was famous they had the whole quarterback change every year they went from brian sipe in 84 to doug flutie in 85 that's pretty crazy they had two heisman trophy winners on their team at the same time who had won heisman trophies within three years of each other that's a big deal so i think that they definitely deserve to be number two i think it's very difficult to argue one of these other franchises i've already mentioned should be above them should the bandits be above them because their attendance was a little bit better and what was definitely better, and in 84's case, a lot better, their postseason was worse because at least the Generals lost to the Stars both times. The Bandits do not have that benefit of, hey, they lost to the eventual champion. The Generals do. The Generals have almost as many, well, they might not have as many in a overall quantitative state as the Bandits. In terms of quality of famous, they pretty much beat them. I mean, Donald Trump and Herschel Walker have still been in the media for the past, like, five years. You can argue for what reasons, but they still have been. Donald Trump became the president of the United States. He used to own the generals. I mean, that's crazy to think about. So when you're talking about famous, I mean, it's no competition. The generals are the most famous brand and with the most famous people involved from the United States Football League. Now, before I get into number one, just a couple quick honorable mentions. The Jacksonville Bulls definitely deserve a shout-out. They had unbelievable attendance the two years they existed. But they weren't successful enough in players and overall on the field for me to think that they would be in the top five. The Invaders also did make it to a championship game, but a lot of that was thanks to the Panthers and their attendance wasn't great. But number one, to the shock of nobody, is the Philadelphia slash Baltimore Stars. I mean, seriously, can you argue this is not number one? You can say their attendance wasn't great because newsflash, it was not good at all. I mean, it really wasn't. Ninth, eighth, and twelfth in rankings is horrid. I mean, sub-15K is really bad. They had one decent year of attendance at 28,000, and even then, that was in a year where that was 8th out of, like, 18 teams. So, not good. But they have to be number one. Two championship victories, three championship appearances. They beat New Jersey and Birmingham in 84 and 85. That's crazy. They beat Chicago in the first year, but then did lose to Michigan in the championship game, but then won the basically the rematch against the Invaders two years later. And they have notable people themselves. Sam Mills is a Hall of Famer. Kelvin Bryant, arguably the USFL GOAT. Chuck Yoshina, legendary QB in the USFL. Bart Oates, Sean Landetta. Jim Moore, super famous coach. Playoffs? You know, that guy. Carl P- Peterson. If you ask a Chiefs fan, I mean, he was there for like that whole era of Chiefs football where... They were good about like two-thirds of the time. He was there for like that whole time. So they have their own big names themselves. It might not be 
again, as insane as the generals or even the bandits, but it's still good enough to justify them. We are talking about a pro football hall of famer in Sam Mills. So they definitely deserve to be high on here. Number one, I think they deserve it. Again, yes. They get hit really hard with the fact that their attendance sucked. But they won two championships, made it to three, and their wins. 48 wins is unbelievable. The Stallions had 38. That was second place, was 38. They had 10 more wins. Their worst season was 10-7-1. They went 16-2 and two one year. Like we talked about, they lost to the Generals both times, but then beat them in the trilogy. They lost three times in the first year and then lost in the championship game. You can't put anyone else at number one, in my opinion, as a franchise. Again, I would buy an argument for the Generals if your argument is purely in a would they have lasted, how great. But when you're talking about two championships and three appearances, I think that kind of overtakes that. Well, they had to move, well, their attendance sucked. Because when you're talking about winning like that, I mean, it's like if you were talking about the modern UFL. The Battlehawks, all the credit to their fans. They're not the best UFL franchise. The Stallions are. They've won three championships. There's no debate. You can't argue that. You can't argue the Battlehawks are a better franchise right now. If the league were to fold and say which franchise was the best, it'd be the Stallions. The Battlehawks are probably coming second, despite the fact that they didn't win anything in the postseason. And in fact, haven't won a playoff game. But they'd be second because of their attendance. But they would not be first because the Stallions' championship victories and overall victories in the regular season is so insane, you cannot argue that. That's this Stars. That's these Stars. Two championships, ten more wins than the second best team. It's not even close. Number one is the Stars. So that'll do it for my list. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell. Again, this might be a bit controversial to some people because, again, it is kind of, you know, talking about a lot of different things, attendance, people, wins and losses. But I think it's a very valid list. I think that, personally, I think these five teams, with an argument for the Bulls, are the five best franchises the USFL had. Now, how you want to order them, I think that the top two have to be the Stars and Generals, and the bottom, or the bottom three of the top five have to be the Bandits, Stallions, and, of course, the Panthers. Now, how you order that, I can buy arguments for different things. But I think that, overall, I think the Panthers at five does make sense. I think if you take away their championship, they would probably fall to like the 7th, 8th, maybe even like the ninth, probably the 8th best franchise without that championship. Whereas the Bandits don't need a championship. If they had one, they'd move up probably to 2 kind of deal. That's kind of how I view it. But again, let me know down below what you think. And then let me know what you guys think this the next week's video is going to be. Again, I'm doing the top 5 worst USFL franchises next week. And while you all probably know what number 1 is, if you know anything about the original USFL, the rest of it is a big deal because a lot of those other franchises are pretty tough to talk about. How much credit do you give Hall of Fame players versus terrible attendance? You probably know what team I'm talking about when I say that. There's a lot of things that can be very debatable with the worst franchises. Whereas the top, I think that these top 5 franchises, again, you can argue the Bulls. But aside from them, I just mentioned the Invaders because they got to one. But I think that aside from the Bulls, there's really no other franchise you can argue being a top five best franchise. Whereas worst, there's some you can argue. Again, we'll see next week when that video comes out. It should come out like a week later from this one. Again, if you enjoyed this, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell like I said earlier. If you've been a fan of the channel for a while, think about becoming a channel member. I have a link in the description to join. I have the 99 cents and the 2.99 cent tier where I give a bunch of stuff. And again, I want to have a ma major shout out to G-Man. G-Man gifted a membership recently, a $2.99 membership for the first Community Hero tier. I hope Molten ends up enjoying his membership and maybe wants to renew it and keep going. But again, I want to thank G-Man for that. And as always, guys, have a great night.